he's here today. Amen. Worship the Lord. I'm going to try to sing an old song. There's a voice calling me from an old rugged tree, and it whispers, draw closer.
personal Savior, but I'm glad I got a personal experience along with it. That's the experience of Pentecost. <clears throat> Amen. So glad that you're here this morning. Amen. So appreciate your faithfulness. So good to see Sister Debbie and Laura walk in. Amen. Appreciate them being here today. If you haven't been, visited our Facebook page yet, you need to do so. I got a text the other morning, Saturday morning, I think it was, at 5 o'clock in the morning. Hey, I just listened to one of your messages on Facebook. Glad I got to hear it. Amen. So that's all right. Hallelujah. I don't mind getting texted at 5 o'clock in the morning for that reason. Isaiah chapter number 28, we're going to get into the word of the Lord. Today is also Mission Sunday. Faith promise will have a play down for you later. <clears throat> Isaiah chapter number 28. I'm going to read verses 11 and 12. I'm going to read from three different books this morning, so just bear with me as we get through the word of the Lord. Isaiah chapter 28, verse number 11. The Bible says, For with stammering lips and another tongue <clears throat> will he speak to his people. To whom he said, this is the rest wherewith you may cause the weary to rest. And this is the refreshing, yet they would not hear. <clears throat> Joel chapter 2, beginning of verse number 23. Joel chapter 2, and then we're going to go into the book of Acts chapter 2 for our final scriptures. Joel chapter 2, Beginning of verse number 23, the Bible says, Be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he hath given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain, and the latter rain in the first month. And the floor shall be full of wheat, and the vat shall overflow with wine and oil. And I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten, the canker worm, and the caterpillar, and the palmer worm, my great army which I sent among you. And ye shall eat in plenty, and be satisfied, and praise the name of the Lord your God, that hath dealt wondrously with you, and my people shall never be ashamed. And ye shall know that I am in the midst of Israel, and that I am the Lord your God, and none else. My people shall never be ashamed. Verse 28, And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And upon the ser servants and upon thine handmaidens in those days will I pour out my Spirit. I'm going to read that verse 28 and 29 again. The Bible says, And it shall come to pass that afterward, afterward that I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh. 
Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit. It's a prophecy by the prophet Joel. Acts chapter 2, I'm going to read verses 1 through 4. And then I'm going to read verses 16 and 17. Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, beginning verse number 1, the Bible says, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all in one accord in one place. Suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. There appeared to them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it set upon each of them, and they were all filled. Everybody say they were all filled. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Verse 16, the Bible says, But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Hallelujah. Aren't you thankful that you know what that is? Hallelujah. I want to preach to you with the help of the Lord this morning on Pentecost Sunday. I want to preach to you Pentecost. This is that. Hallelujah. If there's ever been a doubt in your mind, this is that. This is original. Amen. Can we lift our hands one more time? We love you, Jesus. God, we ask the anointing of the Holy Ghost to be upon us today. God, that we might speak the word of the Lord as you've given it to us. Anoint my lips. Anoint your servant one more time. We worship and magnify the name that's above every name. God, we're so thankful for the visitation of the Holy Ghost that's in the house this morning. God, we ask the anointing of your Spirit to rest upon us, God. Speak to our hearts, Lord. Fill souls with the Holy Ghost. God, fill souls with the Holy Ghost. God, those that are away from you, draw all upon their hearts. God, draw all upon their minds. God, let them see their need for you. In the name of Jesus Christ, praise the name of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise God. God bless you. You may be seated. Peter said, this is that. Hallelujah. What a powerful thought. This is that. That one phrase indicates that the thing, the moment, the article that somebody has been hearing about uh, all of their life, those of that thing that you've been reading about, and, and in, the, in the case of uh, Christians, the thing that we've been uh, studying about and hearing preached about is now present. This is that. This is exactly what we've been told about, and it has finally arrived. We know today, and there are some things that, that I might question. There are some things, believe it or not, that I don't know. But there is one thing that I know today for a fact that everybody that repents of their sins and looks to Jesus Christ through the eyes of faith and is baptized in the name of Jesus Christ can and will receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Amen. It is a promise given by God, and God never reneges on a promise. Amen. We know that people that repent can receive the Holy Ghost. A person may hear of somebody else receiving the Holy Ghost, or you might even see somebody receive the Holy Ghost, but when you receive the Holy Ghost for yourself, amen, when you receive the gift of the Holy Ghost at an altar of repentance and God begins to utter words through your brain and through your mouth that you don't know, amen, as a sign to you that the Holy Ghost ghost has come upon you. Amen. There is nothing like that feeling. You can argue with a lot of things, but friend of mine, there's one thing I won't argue about, and that is that the Holy Ghost is real. Amen. Jesus is real, and he's living down inside of me this morning. Amen. Brother Hopkins, do you believe in speaking in another language? I do. I did this morning. Amen. I'm so thankful today that God's Spirit is present present with us. Amen. When you receive the Holy Ghost, amen, you have you can understand what Peter said when he said this is that. Amen. Pentecost was not a surprise on the prophetic landscape. 
it didn't happen just out of thin air. It wasn't plan B or plan C in the eyes of God. From the very beginning of time, I believe that God knew that there was going to be a Pentecost. The outpouring of the Holy Ghost was foretold by the prophets. Isaiah prophesied, Joel prophesied, others prophesied about the coming Messiah and the Holy Ghost. To have the Spirit of God inside of you with the evidence of His Spirit is without, is without, is very clear in both Testaments, not only the New Testament, but the Old Testament as well. I want to take you to Mark chapter, or I'm sorry, John chapter 4 and tell you a story that Jesus encountered a woman at the well, amen, of Samaria. She was a woman that had five husbands, amen. The one she was living with was not her husband, amen. Her, her life was a mess, amen. It was a total wreck, amen. But Jesus, and when he encountered her at the well, it was by no accident, amen. It was so in the plan of God for him to be sitting on the wellhead that day when the woman came to draw water from the well. Amen. His disciples wanted to go a different direction, but Jesus said, I need to go through Samaria. I need to visit somebody in Samaria. Amen. It was by divine design that Jesus met this woman at the well. Amen. This had to do more when he said to his disciples he needed to pass through Samaria. It had more to do with this one single woman than the whole town of Samaria. I know the Bible tells us later because of this woman's testimony there was revival in the land of Samaria, but his intent to go through Samaria included just one single woman of ill repute, a woman that was not favored, was not invited to the women's club meeting. Amen. She was not invited to tea time. Amen. She was an outcast. Amen. The woman was surprised that he would pass her way. The Bible says she was even surprised that he would even talk to her. The fact that she was a Samaritan. A Samaritan was a Gentile and a Hebrew mix. Amen. They were not accepted by the Gentile community. Neither were they accepted to the Hebrew community either. They were, in fact, the down and outers. They were the outcast. Amen. So she was surprised that he would even speak to her and ask her to draw, draw water for him before she drew water for herself. This woman was the only one that we read about in the scripture that he had contact with. She was the only one at this particular time coming to the well because of her shame and because of her lifestyle. She didn't want to be out to where people would speak to her. We don't know that Jesus come in contact with anybody else but this one individual that day at the well. I want you to understand, saints of God and sinner friend, this one thing. It doesn't matter where your Samaria is. It doesn't matter where you find yourself down and out and downtrodden. It doesn't matter where you find yourself in this life. Jesus will change his itinerary in order to find you. Jesus will find you no matter where you're at. You might be holed up in a despicable place like Samaria. Amen. But Jesus is going to appear at your wellhead. When you come out in the secrecy of time, Jesus will meet you there. Hallelujah. Jesus was showing her of good things that was to come. Amen. He showed her that his compassion one day would cross all lines of ethnicities. Amen. It would, it, he was showing her that there was no boundaries to his grace and his mercy. It doesn't matter if you don't have Pentecost in your pedigree. It doesn't matter whether you've ever been to church in your life or not. Amen. It doesn't matter if you're the best in the family or the worst in the family. It doesn't matter if you're the white sheep or the black sheep. Amen. It doesn't matter where you find yourself in life. You may find yourself in the pit of your own Samaria, Samaria but Jesus is saying my grace is able to cover that my grace is able to cross those lines that we put up to separate 
Acts chapter 1, verse 8, the Bible says, But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria. This was after the fact. This was after he met the woman with Samaria. Amen. He simply said, I'm not only going to do it to the Jews, but I'm also going to give it to the outcast. How am I, when you receive the Holy Ghost, it doesn't matter who you are. Amen. God is going to give you power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Amen. He's going to do it in Jerusalem, Judea, and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth from Broadway to the jungles of Africa. Amen. The grace of God and the Holy Ghost is readily available for you today. Aren't you thankful for the promise of the Holy Ghost? I said, aren't you thankful for the promise of the Holy Ghost? The promise of the Holy Ghost was to all people, including those of Samaria. Before God can fill someone with the Holy Ghost, amen, the individual has to have faith. We talk about the three steps of salvation, repentance, baptism, and the infilling of the Holy Ghost. But salvation comes literally in four steps. You've got to have faith. You've got to believe. Faith precedes every other step that we must take to experience redemption. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse number 1, Now faith is a substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Verse number 6, But without faith it's impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of the, them that diligently seek him. Amen. When Jesus gave his final instruction, to those outside of Bethany just before he ascended out of their sight. He said, but he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. But he that believeth not shall be damned. Amen. Jesus himself said the very first step for salvation is you got to believe. You got to have faith. The importance of faith cannot be overstated. Amen. But faith by itself is not sufficient. Hallelujah, just believing on the Lord Jesus Christ is not sufficient. James chapter 2, verses 14 through 26. What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith and hath not works? Can faith save him? Can just simply believing save a person? If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding ye give them not those things which are needful to the body, what doth it profit? Even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works and I will show thee my faith by my works. Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. But will thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he, was, when he had offered Isaac his son upon an altar? Seest thou how, how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness and he was called the friend of God. But you see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. Likewise also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she had received the messengers and had sent them out another way. For as the body without the spirit of is dead, so faith without works is dead also. He meant it's not sufficient just to believe, he meant on Jesus Christ. It's not sufficient just to believe on him uh, for salvation. You've got to apply works to that, and I am not believed. I believe that we are saved by grace, uh, he meant, but there's some things that we've got to do in reaction to the mercy and the grace of God. First of all is repentance. Hallelujah, I may preach a while, I may talk a while, I may teach a while. But John the Baptist's ministry emphasized repentance. And Jesus commanded repentance in St. Luke chapter number 13 and verse number 3. He meant it is the right thing to do. 
Amen. We have to repent of our sins. We've got to tell God that we're sorry for what we've done. Amen. We've got to tell him that we're sorry for living a life that is away from him and that we've transgressed the laws of God. The very first message at Pentecost followed the initial outpouring of the Holy Ghost. Amen. And it, it included repentance. Amen. It's consistent with the plan of God from the beginning of time. Amen. There's all through the pages of the Old Testament was sacrifice after sacrifice after sacrifice. And those sacrifices represented the repentance of the people. To repent means to turn from sin and to dedicate oneself to the amendment of one's life. It means to feel regret or contrition. It means to change one's mind. While it's possible to have relapses from time to time, true repentance means an about face from the lifestyle of sin and working toward and walking toward a lifestyle of godliness and holiness. Amen. You have not fully repented if you get up from repentance and continue in your ways. Amen. You have not completely repented. You have not fully repented if you continue in your air of your walk. If you get up from repentance and you continue to do what you've been doing. It is an about face. It's not a 360. It's a 180. Hallelujah. It's an about face. You turn 180 degrees and you stop doing the things that you once done. Paul alluded to this. He said, the things that I used to hate, I now love. And the things that I used to love, I now hate. Paul had done an about face from the road of Damascus. He was out to destroy. He was out to imprison the Christians. But when he met his personal experience on Damascus Road, he man, God showed his light upon him and Paul was instructed on what to do. He didn't leave the Damascus Road just believing on Jesus. Hallelujah. He went in the city and Ananias told him the things he had to do, which which included baptism. Amen. We want you to understand that the scripture is not uh, missing or not, uh, doesn't have a lack of examples of salvation. Amen. After you repent of your sins, we are instructed, Peter said on the day of Pentecost, repent and be baptized, not anyway, but he gave a specific mode or a specific method on baptism. He said you must be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of those sins. In order, the, the order in the early church was for people to believe, to repent, to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ and receive the Holy Ghost with the initial evidence of speaking in an unknown tongue or an unknown language. You can read about in Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 8, and Acts chapter 19. Amen. I understand that some people receive the Holy Ghost before they're baptized, but the plan of God is incomplete until you are baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Until you're born of water, John chapter 3. Amen. It completes what Jesus told Nicodemus. You've got to be born again of water and of spirit or you cannot see the kingdom of God. He meant so many people go to the pool of baptism and that's as far as they go. He meant somebody gets the Holy Ghost evidenced by an unknown tongue and they don't feel the need of baptism. He meant some feel that baptism is an option. He meant there was no option B or option A to the Apostle Peter's message. You've got to repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ and receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Acts chapter number 10 in the house of Cornelius. He meant as Peter began to preach, as he preached, the Bible says that the Holy Ghost fell. He meant they received the Holy Ghost before they were baptized. But listen to Peter. Peter commanded them to be baptized in water in the name of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Some, be, some become confused when they read Jesus' commandment in Matthew 28 and 19, in which he said to be baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. There's no reason today to be confused when you understand that the Father, 
the Son, and the Holy Ghost are not proper nouns, but they're titles describing God and His redemptive manifestation. We, know, we all know that according to Matthew chapter 2, amen, that Jesus is the name of the Son, amen, but we should also know that Jesus is called the Father in Isaiah's prophecy chapter 9 verse 6, his name shall be called Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, amen, and we also know that the name of the Holy Ghost in John chapter 14, amen, is Jesus, this is the reason that Jesus used the singular popular the, the noun the word name in Matthew chapter 28:19 rather than the plural names in Matthew 28:19 if father son and holy ghost was names he would have said names but he said name converts were baptized in the name of Jesus Christ the scripture is consistent not one time, amen, not one instance were the titles Father, Son, and Holy Ghost used in baptizing converts in the Bible. Not one. All references in which formula was given or suggested the name of Jesus Christ is the one and only name given. Amen. On the day of Pentecost, chapter number, Acts chapter 2, to the Samaritans, Acts chapter 10, also in Acts chapter 10, to the Gentiles in Israel, the disciples in Ephesus in Acts chapter 19, the disciples in Rome, Romans chapter 6, the disciples in Colossae, Colossians chapter 2, the disciples in Corinth, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and the disciples in Galatia, Galatians chapter number 3. Everyone baptized in the New Testament church was baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. You might find somebody being baptized in the titles Father, Son, and Holy Ghost in a book, but it's not going to be this book. I don't know if you grabbed a hold of that or not. You're going to find it, but it's not going to be in the Bible. Amen. They're going to find somebody come along and said, amen, this is not the way Jesus said it. Well, let me just tell you something. If you believe this morning that you should be baptized in the titles Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, then you believe in the great cons- what I call the great conspiracy theory of the Bible. There's never been a conspiracy pulled off like you believe has been pulled off. Hallelujah. Because the Bible says in Acts chapter 2 when Peter got up to preach, he, man, he stood with the 11 disciples in unison. They were standing in agreement to the apostle Peter. So if you believe that Peter was wrong and you weren't supposed to baptize in the name of Jesus Christ but Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, you believe that before Peter stepped out on the porch to preach on the day of Pentecost that all 12 of them got together and says, boys, we got to change this. I know Jesus said Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, but I I feel that I'm going to preach Jesus Christ. If one disciple... Hallelujah. It would have only took one to say, listen, that's not what Jesus told us to do. But the reason this morning that all 11 stood with the Apostle Peter and the reason the Apostle Peter uttered the word or the name Jesus Christ, he meant because they understood full and good that when Jesus said baptize him in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, he was talking about his name, Jesus Christ. Aren't you thankful today that we can go by the book? He meant, I don't care about the history books. I want to know what the Bible says we have no biblical records of even one person being baptized in the titles Father, Son and Holy Ghost amen Paul to the church at Ephesus says there is but one body and one spirit even as you are called into one hope of your calling one Lord one faith one baptism. Amen. If you can baptize in the titles and you can baptize in the name of Jesus Christ in my simple work county education, that's not one. That's two. That's two different baptism unless they're the same thing. Hallelujah. Oh, I wish I could preach. Hallelujah. 
when you're filled with the Holy Ghost, you receive the Spirit of Jesus Christ in your life. At Romans chapter 8, verse number 11. What a joyful thought to know that we have Jesus Christ living in us. The Bible says he's Christ in us, the hope of glory. Hallelujah. I know that there's people out there that says you Pentecostals think that if we cut you open, we'd find Jesus in there. Hallelujah. You're going to find a lot of things if you cut me open, but it's not going to be Jesus. But that doesn't take away the fact that Jesus says, I am with you, but I shall be in you. Hallelujah. We are literally filled with the Holy Spirit of God when we receive the Holy Ghost. And when you receive the Holy Ghost, you literally take on a portion of his divine nature. We become a little bit more like Jesus. I sung the song, whatever it takes to be more like you. Amen. Let me tell you what it's going to take to be more like him. Amen. Get as full of the Holy Ghost as you can get. Amen. Pray in the Holy Ghost every time you pray. Amen. Get close to God. Amen. Then you can be more like him. We are literally filled with the Spirit of God. Amen. When we receive the Holy Ghost. It's not given to us so that we can say we have it. Amen. The Holy Ghost is given to us. Amen. To help Help us to become more like him. Without the Holy Ghost, we have no hope. Without the Spirit of God, he says, you're none of mine. And the Holy Ghost in the Bible is always accompanied with an initial sign to the convert and to those that are witnesses that the, that, and that sign is that they will speak in a language that is unknown to them. Those disciples that were with Peter recognized that the house of Cornelius received the Holy Ghost because they said they spoke in tongues like we did. It's a sign to those around you that you have received the Holy Ghost. It's a sign to you that you've received the infilling of the Holy Ghost. We know that in the upper room that this occurred because the Bible says that there were some 15 nations gathered outside the upper room when it was noised abroad. And the Bible says that all 15 nationalities heard their own language coming from the upper room. And they knew that there was something going on because they recognized the people in the upper room were not from their home countries. And they were praising God and they were glorifying God. Acts chapter 10 verses 44 through 46 and while Peter yet spake these words the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word and they of the circumcision which believed were astonished, astonished as many as came with Peter because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost for they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. I want you to understand today in 2019 if you receive the Holy Ghost like the Bible says you're going to speak in a language that you didn't learn in school. Amen. It may be Spanish. It may be German. I don't know what it is. But you ain't going to know what you'll say. Somebody else might be able to interpret it. But you're not going to know it's a sign to you that God has taken the most rebellious thing in your life, your tongue, that no man can tame. And God says, I'm going to control it, and I'm going to make it speak words that I'm going to give it. Sister Carter. Joe prophesied in detail of the outpouring of the Holy Ghost that was to come. His prophecy promised a universal outpouring of the Holy Ghost. He said all flesh, all flesh. The crowd had gathered outside of the upper room and Peter stood up to preach the first message of Pentecost. And he preached to them the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. <laughs> Verse number 36, the Bible says, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. And when the crowd came to the realization of what they had done, when they come to a realization that they crucified the Messiah, that they crucified the one that they were looking for, when they come to that realization, they, their hearts was convicted. The Bible uses the word prick. Their hearts were pricked. The people begin to cry out to the apostle Peter. 
begin to question the apostles. They said, men and brethren, what must we do? Sister Sherry, what they were simply saying was, what do I got to do to be saved? What do I have to do to make it right? What do I have to do to get right with what I've done? Amen. I'm so sorry that I have did what I did, and I need to repent. And Peter stood out on the day of Pentecost, and these was the, this was the answer to the question that they had. What must we do? He said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the Holy Ghost. I want you to understand something, saints of God, if you've heard me say it once you've heard me say it many times if the question is the same the answer is the same if you're here this morning and you want to know what it takes to be saved I'm going to tell you the answer that's in the book you got to repent you got to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ and you need to be filled with the Holy Ghost hallelujah you come up to me after church and you're trying to figure something out and you say, Preacher, my mind's blank. What is one plus one? I'm going to tell you two. Hallelujah. If you come up to me and say, Pastor, I'm having trouble with my multiplication table. What is two times two? I'm going to tell you four. And you know when I learned that? I learned that back in grade school. And if the question is the same, two times two will always be four. I don't know if you're getting a hold of what I'm saying or not. Hey Amen. It's always going to be the same, friend. The, when you come to the realization that you need Jesus Christ and you are lost without Him, and if He would come today, you would spend eternity in a lake of fire. When you come to the realization that i got to know what it takes to get right with God, hey Amen. the answer is still going to be the same as it was 2,000 years ago on the day of Pentecost. Hey Amen. you got to repent. You need to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. The power of Pentecost is still available today. God has not stopped filling people with the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. When the Holy Ghost is poured out as we stand together. No one has, no one who has ever been baptized with the Holy Ghost will doubt the reality of that experience. They will know when you receive the Holy Ghost, those of you here this morning that have received the Holy Ghost, amen, you will know the reality. Because you will know the glorious gift of God's Spirit is Jesus Christ in you. And when you get the Holy Ghost, you can simply say to your friends and neighbor, this is that, that the prophet spoke about in the prophecy of Joel. If you're in the house today and you haven't repented, you haven't been baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, or if you've not yet received the Holy Ghost, you can have it before you leave here today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. There's a, there's a scripture that I love so much, and I like to talk about it. We get excited about Acts chapter 2, verses 1 and 8, or chapter 1, verse 8. We, we, we talk about uh, Acts chapter 2, 36, or 38 rather. But that, there's a scripture that tags on to verse number 38. And the Bible says, for the promise. What promise? The promise of the outpouring of the Holy Ghost. The promise is unto you, or it's for you, and for your children, and to all those that are far off. Here's the part I like. This is some shouting stuff here. Even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Why is that shouting material preacher? Because there is, again, no biblical reference to indicate that Jesus has stopped calling. The call of God is still alive and well today. It's telling you in Elizabeth, West Virginia, on Pentecost Sunday 2019, amen, that the Holy Ghost is available for you today. And you can have it. You can walk away from this place saying this is that. He is still calling. And if he's still calling, he's still filling. Hallelujah. He's still filling people with the Holy Ghost. 
Ghost. Hallelujah. Amen. As the music plays, would you come forward? Let's come and pray.